Okay, so picking up where we left off last time. Um, so uh, let's um, talk about this thing called path independence. Now, th this is in the book. It's actually in the book earlier than the fundamental theorem of Lie integral stuff that we've already done. Uh, there are different pros and cons for doing topics in different orders, and uh, it's just kind of a, an opinion thing. So anyway, here we go. Um, here's what path independence says. It's a pretty surprising property uh, to claim. And uh, and that is that uh, a path-independent vector field, and sometimes people like to say has path-independent line integrals, I think that's unnecessarily wordy and arguably misleading. Uh, I prefer to say that the vector field is path-independent, shorter. It emphasizes that this is a property of the vector field. It's not really intrinsically a property of the line integral as a whole. It's a property of the vector field. Um, so anyway, a path-independent vector field has the following feature. And that is that if you pick a starting point and pick an ending point, and then if you have any two curves that have that starting point, that ending point, so they have to share the same starting point, same ending point, uh, these two line integrals will give you the same value. The green line integral and the blue line integral, same value. Now, I, I, uh, I, I find this, uh, at a glance anyway, kind of implausible. How could this possibly be? But let's just take a careful look here at these integrals. Right, This green line integral is computed on this green curve, which is going to be looking at the vector field F at the points over here. Whereas this blue line integral will be looking at the values of the vector field at completely different points. Totally different points. So that, that, that seems, uh, how could there be any relationship between these? I mean, they're totally different curves. Right? Seems very surprising uh, that this could ever uh, be the case. So now, <clears throat> again, I emphasize this, this property that we're describing. This is a property of the vector field, F, right? So this is the thing that we're talking about. The, the integrand is the thing that has this property. Some vector fields have this feature. Very surprisingly, but some vector fields have this feature that, yeah, yeah, sure, just you know, pick any curve you want. Doesn't matter, any curve at all got to have the same starting point, same ending point. But pick any curve you want, you'll always get the same value for the line integral. Shocking feature, and again, I emphasize it's a feature of the vector field. Now, just to emphasize how surprising it is that this is possible, let's look at this really, really easy, what I'm going to call counterexample, and I don't mean that literally. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, an expected example of a vector field that, of course, absolutely does not have the path independence property. Again, as we would kind of expect. Um, so, uh, yeah, this uh, vector field is uh, this thing right here. Uh, you can uh, draw pictures of it, and, you know, it's a good exercise, again, to make sure that you can look at the formula for a vector field and, um, you know, draw a reasonable picture in simple cases like this where it's, you know, pretty straightforward. So uh, that's our vector field. Now let's think about these two line integrals here. We're going to look along that curve right there, and then we're going to look at this curve like that. Notice that as required, both of these curves start at 0, 0. Both of these curves end at 1, 1. So, so these are two appropriate uh, different curves, appropriate in the sense that they have they satisfy the requirement, same starting point, same ending point. Uh, and let's just think through what these line integrals are. I'm going to start with the green one. Uh, going along this part of the curve C1, uh, notice the vector field is identically zero here, so of course you don't pick up any line integral on that part of the curve. Nothing's happening uh, there. On this second part of C1, notice the vector field is pointing up dx is pointing to the right, and those are perpendicular, which means the dot product is zero, which means, again, no line integral there either. And so all together, on that green curve, the line integral is zero. Okay, now for comparison, now let's go around the other curve, C2. So let's you know do like that. And okay, first part of the curve along in here. Well, again, the vector field is up. 
dx is to the right. So on this first segment of C2, again, there's nothing uh, being uh, collected there. But then on C2, excuse me, on the second part of C2 here, the vector field is going up. It's not on zero. It's pointing up. dx is pointing up. There is a significant degree to which the fluid is flowing along that curve. We're going to pick up a positive amount of line integral on that. So zero plus positive gives us that on C2, clearly not zero, right? So again, nothing surprising here. This is what you would expect should kind of generically be the case. The fact that the green and the blue curves share a starting point and ending point, yeah, so what? They're, clear, they're mostly different curves. Okay. So let me let me say this is an example. Uh, the the uh, you know typicalness of this as an example <coughs> is why we shouldn't expect very many, if any, curves to have this path independence property. Okay. But it turns out, if you just look at it the right way, not only are there some vector fields that are path independent, there's actually a whole category of vector fields that are. <coughs> Path independent, uh, and specifically, they are gradients. Now, there's some regularity uh, stuff in there. We need to say that the vector field uh, is also needs to be continuous, and uh, there's all sorts of sticky uh, little uh, problems that arise if you don't have that regularity. But that's not what we're going to focus on in this course. So that's in there just for sort of uh, you know uh, 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 rigor purposes. But uh, that aside, gradients are path independent. And uh, it's actually not even that hard, hard to see why gradients are path independent. In fact, the fundamental theorem of line integrals does it for us. So here again is our scenario. Notice uh, shared starting point, shared ending point, uh, two curves. We have C1 here. Uh, we have C2, like so. Um, <clears throat> I claim that looking as we are at a gradient, these two line integrals have to be the same, and furthermore, it's actually pretty clear why. Let's think about how we would compute the green line integral. Here it is. All right, this green line integral and this curve C1, integral of F. Uh oh, wait a second. Don't forget, f is a gradient. So this is actually an integral of a gradient. And that's what our fundamental theorem of line integrals applies to directly. So this green line integral, I can compute with the fundamental theorem, because the integrand is a gradient. And here's my formula f of b minus f of a. And notice it only looks at what's happening at the endpoints a and b. This formula down here only depends on A and B. And then just for comparison purposes, let's think about that blue line integral. Again, here we go. Blue line integral, our integrand is, again, gradient. Integral of a gradient computed with the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Uh, and again, you get the same answer because by design, same starting point, same ending point. So therefore, the same f of b minus f of a. Uh, so yeah, so nice, nice punchline. Whenever you have a gradient, these two curves that start and end at the same point are going to be evaluated with the exact same computation. So of course, they have the same value. What do you think? Let me pause here for a second. Everybody all right? surprising fact. Okay, uh, it turns out this goes the other way as well. What we've uh, shown here is that gradients are always path independent. Every gradient is path independent. Goes the other way as well. Every path independent vector field <coughs> is a gradient. And again, there's regularity concerns. And by the way, there are really interesting and significant regularity issues that we have to worry about, and uh, we don't want to worry about that, certainly not right now. Um, so the, uh, the convenient punchline is that path independence is really just 
an alternative property of gradients. Every path independent is gradient. Every gradient is path independent. Okay. Now, how you show this latter fact is, uh, is a little bit more effort. Uh, it's uh, not really what I want to uh, focus on. Uh, here is a very, very rough sketch of how you would do that proof. And if you want to think it through, um, this is uh, something you could toy with. Uh, if you're curious and uh, you can't figure out how to fill in the blanks on this, just come on into office hours. I'll be very happy to discuss it with you and show you how to how to make this work. But again, it's you don't have to. It's not part of the course really, so uh, don't uh, don't sweat it. Okay. All right. Now here's a different take, different point of view on path independence. Reminder. Our old point of view, our existing point of view on path independence, same starting point, same ending point. The C1 integral needs to be the same as the C2 integral. Right. Um, some trivial algebra. All I did is subtract the blue integral to the left side of the equation. Basically, nothing happened. Right. Now let's think about what this is. What can I say about, uh, again, with the color choices, uh, what can I say about this? This says I'm going to uh, compute the C1 integral, so I'm going to move along C1. Now this says the C2 integral, but notice the minus sign. Uh, keep in mind that minus signs come from going backwards, right? opposite orientation along the same curve. So you could think of this as saying we're going to move along C1 and then we're going to move backwards along C2. So let me draw that on our picture here, looking at our picture. Moving along C1 and then when we're done going backwards along C2, notice that just kind of goes around sort of in some sense the whole lump there. Right, and check it out further, that's a closed curve. And furthermore, this will always be a closed curve because C1 and C2 start and end at the same point. Therefore, this will always start and end at this single point. So that difference itself can be thought of as a single, what we call closed line integral. So uh, this difference having to be zero is equivalent to saying that this closed line integral must be zero. And that gives us an alternative way to think about path independence. Uh, perfectly reasonable, just as good. Take your pick. Um, a vector field is path independent. Oh, whoopsie. A uh, vector field is, I'll do this in orange, path independent if all of these closed line integrals are always zero. So, two different ways to think about it. You can think of it as uh, what you might call compatible curves, same start, same end, are always equal. Or you can think of it as closed line integrals are always zero. Take your pick. And so, uh, sometimes one is more useful than the other, and other times the other is the more useful than the one. Okay. All right, so here is an example of uh, why this latter formulation is, is nice. Um, so uh, let's think about uh, this vector field right here. We're going to look at the gradient of the altitude function. All right? Uh, now, don't forget what gradient is. Gradients always point in the direction of fastest increase. And remember, as we've discussed many times long ago, when you're talking about altitude, direction of fastest increase means direction of steepest ascent. And so this always points uphill. And furthermore, this always points with magnitude <coughs> equal to the steepness. So I think it's a reasonable thing to call this the steepness vector field. That's just a way of thinking about it. Okay, what to do with this thing? Well, it's clearly a gradient. There it is. It's the definition of it. We already know gradients are always path independent. We always know that path independent vector fields always have this property. Closed line integrals are always zero. And now uh, let's think about uh, what this says in the context of this picture down here. Uh, this 
uh, image is uh, of uh, uh, a, a piece of artwork by an artist named M.C. Escher from uh, long ago, hundred and some odd years ago. This is you know, uh, way long time ago. Um, and his art was uh, interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, one of them is he drew uh, kind of um, illusions, you know, seemingly real looking images, but that are physical impossibilities, right? So at a casual glance, you look at this at this uh, image, and uh, well, I see some stairs, and there's some people walking along the stairs. What's the problem, right? Well, and you notice that. On the uh, among the people walking around the outside. Oh, let me do this with a better color. The people walking along the outside here, like that person. But well, he's walking uphill, as are all the people in front of him. And then along in here, they're walking uphill. And then as they keep going, they keep going uphill. And then they turn this corner and they keep going uphill. Looks like they're going uphill the whole way around. And then they come back to where they were. And you think about that for a minute. And you think, wait a minute, that doesn't. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's not possible. This couldn't be physical. And so the uh, what's interesting then is how it looks realistic, even though, of course, once you think about it, it's absolutely physically impossible. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we have up here, I think, is uh, could you, one take on this equation I have in orange is that this is the refutation of the suggestion that this picture might be physical because let's keep track now uh, of what this integral is computing. That integral is computing every step along the curve for the entire sort of square that these people are walking around, f dot dx, which is keeping track of how your altitude is changing. So each step that they take along the curve as they go, f dot dx is telling you how much their altitude increases. And, well, each one of these steps, as is figured, uh, suggests that the altitude is increasing with each step. So as is drawn here in the picture, it would make it look like we have a, a exclusively positive terms, which would suggest, you know, as Escher would have us believe, that this integral is positive. But we know from path independence that it can't be positive. It has to be zero because that's just how, you know, round trips work, right? You come back to where you were. You have come back to where you were. Your altitude is exactly the same as it started. Um, so what we have here then is a little bit of math that uh, documents the intuitively obvious statement that, of course, this is a physical impossibility. Is that cool? Okay, moving along. Um, <clears throat> so uh, why do we care about path independence? And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, I'm going to start off with just a really quick aside about uh, path independence. Uh, you know, utility in uh, you know a conceptual sense. And just very briefly, and this isn't a physics class, and I, you know, as much as I would love to go on and on about physics. Um, uh, let's talk about potential energy, right? And potential energy is a, well, it's a physical sort of construction to try to, you know, uh, measure how much energy is stored in the location of where some mass is, right? And the idea is that if, you know, you have something up high, then it has a lot of potential energy, and then you drop it, and it picks up speed, and then as it goes down, it gains kinetic energy, energy of motion, right? But grand total, kinetic plus potential stays the same, right? This is this idea of conservation of energy, again, not in an ecological sense, but in just a, you know, physics mechanics kind of a sense. So, okay, well, this is really useful, right? Conservation of energy is a really powerful tool for uh, answering various mechanics questions in physics. Where does it come from? Right? And this is a deep question, right? Where did this idea of conservation of energy come from? Well, one thing you could say is that it comes from, uh, among other things, the existence of potential energy. All right, where does potential energy come from? 
potential energy, you could take the point of view that potential energy comes from how much work it takes to put something to a certain location. So if I have my pen here on the table and if I call that zero and if I want to lift the pen up to where my hand is, well, I have to think about the amount of work that I perform in lifting the pen up to, you know, from zero up to where my hand is. Right? Which path? Do I go in a straight line? Um, do I go straight up and then over? Um, is it okay if for whatever reason I might want to do some weird sort of spiraling sort of path? Uh, which path should I take? And even worse, if I were to get different amounts of work going <laughs> along different paths, would I be even allowed to talk about potential energy? And the answer is uh, no, you can't, right? So if, uh, if you get different values of work along different paths, then there is no corresponding notion of potential energy. And therefore, there is no notion of conservation of energy because there's no potential energy to define it with. Right? So path independence is a really, really useful idea. Path independence allows us to talk about how much work it takes to get our mass to a location. That's what allows us to define potential energy in the first place. And thus, that's what allows us this super powerful computational tool in physics. So that's a pretty neat use of path independence. Um, like I say, it's a, kind of a conceptual use, but still. Well, I think, you know, really important, really useful. Okay, um, <clears throat> that said, it is also useful computationally, but uh, here's, here's kind of the, the, the disappointment in the idea of using path independence as a computational tool. If you were going to use path independence, well, that means you're talking about a gradient which means you could just use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And as we know, the fundamental theorem of line integrals is pretty awesome as a computational tool, right? I mean, just uh, boom, just plug and chug into the formula. So what we ha so at best, it would seem, computationally, path independence is a solution to a problem for which we already had a solution. So, you know, who needs it? Hey, Skippy. Now, that said, there are some uh, instances where it's actually very useful because there are some instances in which when you try to find the anti-gradient, you run into some problems. Uh, sometimes it's just a, uh, just a uh, computational, uh, I'm going to have to take some anti-derivatives, and sometimes anti-derivatives are hard, right? So that's, uh, that's a real thing that happens sometimes. But uh, anyway... Here's an example of how you would use path independence in such a case. So uh, you'll notice uh, right here we have a vector field. I'm claiming that it's path independent. I'll comment later as to how I knew that. Nice answer to that question. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, now, again, as an aside, being path independent, we know it's a gradient. Therefore, we know there's an anti-gradient, and if you were to sit down and think cleverly and strategically, you could probably even dream up what the anti-gradient is. Just kind of look at it and kind of think about it and play, you know, try to be smart out as much as you can, and you'll get it, no problem. But let's suppose you couldn't, and we want to compute a line integral of that vector field on this curve, drawn as so. How would we do that? Well, we could plug and chug. I can parameterize this curve. That's going to involve sines and cosines. That means my integral is going to be full of, uh, you know, complicated expressions involving sines and cosines. And it's not that you can't do it, but, you know, all is being equal. We maybe prefer not to have to. Okay, so here's where path independence kicks in. Since I know that it's path independent, all I got to do is nail down the starting point, nail down the ending point, and now dream up whatever alternate curve you might prefer. Take your pick. Entertain your whims. Whatever you want to do. If you want to use this curve right there, go for it. Perfectly fine. Whatever you want. Now, I don't recommend that one. 
right? Obviously. Um, I think a, a much better choice is to uh, take a nice straight line like that. Uh, straight lines are easy to parameterize. Straight lines uh, give nice, convenient coincidences sometimes that we're about to experience, and I'll point that out when we get there. But the point is, uh, all else being equal, pick the easiest curve you can think of, and I think that's it. Uh, and again, path independence is what allows me to say I'm going to use the green curve instead of the blue curve uh, and, uh, and just kind of go from there. So with that said, I'm going to unload that blue curve. I've completely transformed the question now. Instead of computing on this curvy curve, now I can just do the computation on this straight line curve, and life is much better. No trig. Right, right off the bat, I see I, I've just spared myself a bunch of trig. Uh, now, let's do the plug and chug. That's how you parameterize. Easy parameterization. Uh, a couple of particularly nice things to notice about this parameterization. Uh, notice that y is 0 for that whole parameterization. And that means that the first coordinate of my vector field is going to be 0 for this entire calculation. It wasn't on the first curve. This is a perk of having switched to the second curve. Okay. Um, here's the other thing to notice, and, uh, you know, look, uh, this, there's different ways to think about this. I'm just going to make the observation kind of geometrically here that notice that as I move along this curve, notice why is not changing. Right now, of course, that's clear from the fact that it's always zero, right? But I'm just going to phrase it as y is not changing, and if y is not changing, uh, said differently, because of the fact that the, uh, the tangent line is always horizontal, that means dy is always zero. And if dy is equal to zero, then notice in my actual calculation here, I'm this, here's the dot product I'm going to have to do, and that dot product just boop, instantly becomes zero. We win. Didn't have to get our hands dirty at all. What do you think? Everybody happy? All right, so, uh, so it has its moments uh, computationally. It allows you to turn one problem into a different problem that, you know, if you're clever about how you set it up, will be an easier new problem. Okay. All right. So uh, there is a test for identifying when a uh, vector field is path independent, a.k.a. a gradient. Keep in mind, every path independent is a gradient. Every gradient is path independent. Um, here's what the test is. A vector field being a gradient of something can be detected by looking at Green's operator and seeing if you get zero. And this is, uh, this is a heck of a nice test because if you think about it, um, <clears throat> uh, knowing that something is a gradient is, I want to say what, what you might call a global problem. You need to find a single function f that satisfies this requirement. One single function that satisfies this requirement everywhere. All right, and that's a, that's a trick. You need to find the function that does that. Right? Um, this is what I like to call a local test because you can detect the way you decide on this local test is by doing the computation just at one point at a time, right? Uh, you can compute Green's <laughs> operator anywhere independent of your computation of Green's operator at other locations. And as long as they're all zero independently, you're good here, right? So we get what I like to call a global conclusion from a local test. And that's a, a nice uh, a nice convenience. So here's um, here's how this argument works. Uh, here's why this works. Uh, and I'm going to remind you, we've already talked about these three conditions being the same. Gradient, always simultaneous with being path independent, which could be rephrased as closed line integrals are equal to zero. Right? So old news, we already know those three conditions are the same. Now let's look at these two conditions. Oh, whoops. Try to get this. 
Okay, so these two conditions right here, I claim that these two conditions are always simultaneous. Uh, whenever the left condition happens, the right condition happens, and vice versa. And it's true because of Green's theorem. Notice that a closed line integral is a line integral around a boundary, and Green's theorem says that a line integral around a boundary is a double integral of Green's operator. So Green's theorem shows that the left side of the left equation is always equal to the left side of the right equation. Yeah? Remember that from last time. So therefore, the suggestion that this integral is always zero, it's an equivalent rephrase to say that this integral is always zero. Okay, is that cool? Is everybody on board with that? Okay, last step. How do I know that these two conditions are the same? And it comes from thinking about this integrand right here. Right, We're looking at a double integral. Uh, double integral here of this function happens to be Green's operator, whatever. We have a double integral of some function, and it's always zero. For every D, for every domain, no matter what area you look at, pick any region in the plane at all. This is in the plane, by the way, right here. Pick any region in the plane, double integral always zero. What could that function possibly be? What function has all of its integrals equal to zero? And I propose there is only one continuous function uh, whose integrals are always zero. And that is zero. Everybody buy that one? Okay. So we are done. Uh, this is the uh, argument. Uh, really nice result. Uh, and this is what I like to call the local test. Uh, the local test in two dimensions for path independence is just compute frames operator. See if you get zero. Um, a little bit of terminology that's worth talking about. Um, <clears throat> a vector field that has this property, that Green's operator is zero, is sometimes called irrotational. I think this is a uh, very reasonable term. Uh, keep in mind what Green's operator is. Green's operator is circulation density. Keep in mind circulation is a measure of how much the fluid is kind of rotating, kind of going around. Right? In some sense, there's a uh, rotational aspect to the fluid. So Green's operator is a measurement of the extent to which the fluid is rotating. And saying that that is zero is saying that there is no rotational aspect to the fluid. And thus the term, I think, very reasonable for <coughs> rotational. What do you think? Reasonable? Okay, now again, this is only in two dimensions, uh, as it noted right there, just in two dimensions. Uh, what happens if you're in three dimensions? Is there an analogous theorem? Is there an analogous argument to demonstrate that theorem? And uh, yes, and yes, uh, here's the analogous theorem. In two dimensions, you look at Green's operator. In three dimensions, you look at curl. Now, uh, to the question of the analogous argument, you know, so we had this argument here that, uh, you know, we kind of, you know, argued through like that. And uh, what is the analogous, you know, is there an analogous argument down here? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it uses a theorem we just haven't talked about yet. And we'll, we'll get to it um, Oh gosh, let me think now, uh, the next couple of weeks anyway. I mean, it's one of the last things we're gonna do in the course, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's basically a three-dimensional version of Green's theorem. It's called Stokes' Curl Theorem. We'll get to that when we get to it. So I'm just gonna assert there is a perfectly analogous argument here to support the three-dimensional version. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Okay, so let's do some examples. Uh, here we go. Uh, this. First example here, here's a vector field. I want to know if it's a gradient. Uh, okay, well that's a three-dimensional vector field. Notice it has three coordinates. 
So it's a vector field in R3. Therefore, my test is to compute the curl, see if I get zero. So here we go. I start computing the curl. The curl uh, is going to have these three different coordinates. And what you're going to notice here is as I'm computing the curl, notice I kind of stopped after the first turn, right? Kind of feels like I uh, threw in the towel, right? But keep in mind, I don't actually need to know what the curl is. All I need to know, according to this theorem, I just need to know is it identically zero or not. And I can already tell, right? Looking at this example right here, the first coordinate, not always zero. It might be zero sometimes, that doesn't matter, right? But it's not always zero. And if the first coordinate is sometimes non-zero, game over. There's, it doesn't really matter what the second and third coordinates are. This vector is not going to be always exactly zero. So, end of story. Um, so I don't have to look at the vector field here. Um, let's see here. Uh, I don't have to kind of stare at this and try to dream up, okay, wh uh, how can I, you know, what, uh, what could I possibly create where this is going to end up being with the gradient? You don't have to play that game. Curl isn't zero. It's definitely not a gradient. Don't try to find an anti-gradient. There is no anti-gradient. All right. Okay, here's a two-dimensional example. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, what about this vector field? Is that a gradient? Well, again, we're going to go to the local test. This is two dimensions, so we use Green's operator. Easy calculation. Not zero. So, no. Simple as that. Everybody good? All right, now I like this example because it is uh, relatable geometrically. And so, again, let's think about, you know, what we're talking about here. Here's our vector field. This is the vector field we're trying to decide if that's a gradient or not. And uh, keep in mind what gradients are. Gradients point uphill. So if this vector field were a gradient, all of these arrows would point uphill. What kind of a mountain would that be? where uphill goes around in a circle, right? That's kind of nonsense, isn't it? There's just no way. It's just not possible. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's pretty intuitively satisfying, I think, that well, this better not be a gradient. If it were, it wouldn't make any sense. And again, notice this is kind of an Escher stairs argument, right? Uh, it's the same story where, no, I'm sorry, those people cannot all be walking uphill if they come back around to where they need to start. Okay. And by the way, another nice way to think about this, gradients can't circulate, right? So you see, oh, we've clearly got, this vector field is clearly doing some circulation, right? But gradients can't circulate because a circulation of gradient would be, again, a contradictory, uh, you know, non-zero closed line integral. This doesn't work. All right. Okay. So this business about the strategic diagram, um, uh, this is a sort of compact and uh, shortened version of the diagram I want to talk about. Um, Y'all may recall on the website I have uh, other uh, documents. Uh, this is one of them. It's called diagram.pdf. Um, uh, it's easier to expand <laughs> the diagram and put in a bunch of stuff like I have on here uh, when you're using typesetting as opposed to handwriting. All right, so that's why I you know, have just sort of the compact version uh, in the notes. But I want to work off of uh, this right here. So let me try to explain what this is. Uh, there's a bit of a story on this. And, but I think this is an important tool for understanding vector calculus. Uh, certainly once I became aware of, of uh, I'm going to say, this diagram or sort of the ideas in this diagram, uh, my understanding of vector calculus shot up quickly. So, uh, yeah, so here's the story. I've already mentioned 
there is a much more sophisticated take on vector calculus that we're not going to do in this course. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate. It's too sophisticated. It's very abstract. It has a bunch of machinery that has to get set up. It's just a lot, and it's just not Math 219 appropriate. But what I can do, and, I, and where this diagram came from, is I can take all this sophisticated machinery that we don't want to mess with and boil off all of the formality and all of the, uh, the sophistication and just kind of just leave just the bones and sort of the resulting patterns. Just, again, bare minimum, uh, no, uh, no, 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 um, uh, no uh, intimidating, scary notations and formalities and stuff like that. So when I claim it, this is what you get when you do that. And so there's going to be a lot of stuff as to how this diagram is put together that you might be thinking, hey, why do we do that? And the answer is going to be, well, because, <laughs> because these sophisticated constructions are put together a certain way for sophisticated reasons. The whole point is to not have to worry about all of that. So um, I'm going to suggest you all take this as a magic trick. Uh, and the magic trick is that if you use this as kind of an organizational tool, sort of a mental organizational tool, and just think of these various participants in the stories we've been discussing uh, as being organized, as indicated by this diagram, then amazingly stuff will just start working out. And it's just kind of wild how, uh, how convenient it is. So uh, here is um, starting off with something we've seen before. Back in Chapter 3, I suggested that for reasons that we can't talk about in this class, you should compose gradient and Green's operator like that. No apparent reason. Here we are again. So we're going to compose them in that order because stuff works out nicely if we do. Um, I'm going to say it makes sense to uh, sort of compose boundaries uh, in uh, this direction like this. The idea being that if you take a two-dimensional region and look at its boundary, you get a curve, a one-dimensional curve. right? And then likewise, if you take a one-dimensional curve and look at its boundary, you get points, which you might call zero-dimensional points. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm going to ask, you know, well, look, if you have a point and a function, how do you sort of combine them? Well, you plug the point into the function. That seems reasonable. If you have a curve and a vector field, here's a familiar computation. You can compute the line integral over that curve of that vector field. And likewise, double integral makes these sort of fit together. Okay, so we're going to take all that as just a given. Again, this is what you get when you boil off all of the formalities out of this much more sophisticated stuff. And now I'm going to start playing games. Uh, I'm going to talk through various theorems that we've seen before and just kind of show what they look like on the diagram. So let's start with the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Fundamental theorem of line integrals says that if you uh, have a function and look at its gradient, and if you have a curve and you look at its boundary points, and if you plug in uh, to your original function those boundary points, like so, and if you plug in to this vector line integral the gradient as the vector field and then do the line integral over the original curve, like so, then amazingly you get the same thing. Right, so just to, just to make this a little bit more sort of brief and terse, uh, if you uh, go that way and this way and then evaluate down, you get the same thing on both sides. Now, this has not proved anything. This should not illuminate anything for you. Uh, this is just a pattern, you might say, of what the fundamental theorem of, of line integrals kind of looks like on this diagram. Here's where it gets interesting. Let's play the same game with Green's theorem. Green's theorem says if you have a vector field and you compute Green's operator, 
If you have a two-dimensional region and think about its one-dimensional boundary curve, and if you do a vector line integral of your original vector field on the boundary curve like so, and if you do a double integral of Green's operator on your original area like so, you get the same thing. Notice the pattern's exactly the same, right? I mean, this is this is really pretty surprising. So same pattern of, you know, to the right, to the left, evaluate down, same thing either way. The exact same pattern of Green's theorem is the exact same pattern of the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And that's an eyebrow raiser. That's, uh, wait a second, uh, how could that, that, hmm. Well, these are a lot of similarities given that this is a two-dimensional theorem about areas and their boundary curves. This is a one-dimensional theorem about a curve and its boundary points. They're clearly different things. There are different operators involved. It's the gradient operator here. It's Green's operator here. Totally different context, and yet the pattern is exactly the same. Right? I think that's pretty neato. And this is kind of a, like I say, a, sort of a glimpse of your, what you're seeing here is shadows of this much deeper, more, much more powerful uh, result called the generalized Stokes' theorem uh, that, we can't, that we can't go through in this class itself. Okay, so what is this? Uh, what's the upshot to y'all? The upshot to y'all is that if you think about things in terms of this diagram, uh, you don't have to memorize two separate theorems. Right? You don't have to think of this as being two entirely independent theorems. Think of this as one pattern that you need to know. And the pattern is, as we just discussed, over, back, down on both sides, same thing. And that pattern holds whether you're talking about the fundamental theorem of line integrals or whether you're talking about Green's theorem or what we're going to see coming up pretty soon if you're talking about the three-dimensional fundamental theorem of line integrals Whoops. Uh, or if you're talking about Stokes' curl theorem that we're going to be getting to real soon, two seconds. Uh, or if you're talking about Gauss's divergence theorem. So what we have, uh, arguably five different theorems that all follow exactly the same pattern. You just really need to understand the one pattern. Yes? Um, will this document be posted? It is already. Okay. Yeah, if you, go to the, uh, if you go to my sections, you know, what I call the class website, um, and uh, there is a uh, linked folder called, I think it's called class resources. Uh, it's in there, and the file is called diagram.pdf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's another thing that's useful to notice. Um, <clears throat> and this will be our last thing uh, for today. Um, so let's think about path independence and how path independence and related ideas show up on this diagram. So um, <clears throat> let's see here. Here we go. We have certain important interesting vector fields, um, special vector fields. And recall, what we're talking about here is gradients. Vector fields that are gradient of something. Or you might say vector fields for which there is an anti-gradient, if you prefer. Well, as we've discussed, being a gradient means Green's operator is zero. And we've talked through why that is. And by the way, notice that that means that we now have kind of completed a thought. You remember we were talking about back in Chapter 3, this kind of mysterious statement about uh, you know this sequence of operations. Everything has a lifetime of two. There you go. Right? That's where that comes from. Um, and now here's the third related idea of path independence. And the way I like to draw path independence on here is uh, that if you have two curves with the same boundary points, then you get the same value for the line integral. 
So again, uh, these are what we have here in the three different colors. These are three different properties of the same collection of vector fields, again, ignoring regularity concerns. Um, so why do you care about this pattern? Who cares about drawing that on the diagram? And the reason we care is because when we get into three dimensions, this same pattern is going to hold and give us what the three related properties are for <coughs> special vector fields in three dimensions. And in fact, and this is the weirdest one, you can even move it over up a dimension. There are a different category of special vector fields, which you might call two fields, um, that have, again, three related properties, totally different related properties but that follow this same pattern. Right? So this kind of thing where the patterns just hold uh, <laughs> in a totally different context, the exact same pattern, this is the benefit that you get from doing all of your sort of mental bookkeeping with this diagram organizing all your all your ideas. Good place to end it. See y'all later. Have a good one.